Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, owner of the company Horns of Odin. And to J- to J- today, I'm joined by Julian Post Melby. Julian, thank you for, for joining me. I'm really excited about this episode. We're going to be looking at glacial archaeology, which is fascinating to me. Um, so yeah, if you can just tell everybody kind of maybe who you yeah. are, what you do. Certainly. So thank you for having me on. Yeah, my name is Julian Post Melby, and I'm an archaeologist at the Museum of Cultural Heritage at the University of Oslo in Norway. Uh, I work uh, on the Glacial Archaeology Program, uh, and for many people, they know us through Secrets of the Ice, which is our public outreach mm-hmm. part of the program. So uh, what we do is we survey and uh, do a lot of field work and collecting of artifacts around melting snow in uh, the uh, glaciers and ice patches in uh, south central Norway. So this is the inland the county area where uh, most of the high mountains in Norway are situated. Uh, Norway is of course a very northern country. So as soon as you come above a thousand meters, the tree line is gone, and you're getting into areas with no vegetation and above 1500 meters should get areas of permanent ice and snow and there's permafrost. So we're in that kind of environment. Okay. This might be a super ignorant question to start off with, but is the, is the ice and snow melting? Is it just a, a yearly thing? And then you go in at the right time when it's melting or is it due to outside factors like climate change? Yeah. So, uh, if you can say the field of like what you call glacial archaeology is something that's been emerging in the last couple of decades. And that's mainly because uh, sites and places which have had stable, cold uh, environments for the last, in Norway, for example, close to 8,000 years, and in the Alps, the same. And um, but now the, uh, the ice is retreating at an very fast and uh, this is exposing a lot of sites that have been uh, encased in ice for thousands of years mm-hmm. and uh, so what we do is uh, we have to get in kind of at the end of the summer because uh, there's always there's snow every year in Norway of course and um, so it will start snowing in September and that snow will melt through next year's summer so at the end of August, perhaps, then you're down uh, to the previous year's uh, melt, and that's when it starts to uh, eat away at the ice that's been there for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. So we have like a short window of opportunity every year where we try to get into sites where old ice is melting. So these sites are sadly melting out due to climate change, and this is a worldwide phenomenon. Okay. Phenomenon. So as Norway, for example, the Alps, you have the Yukon in Canada, the Rocky Mountains in the U.S., uh, or the Altai Mountains in Mongolia. So this is something that's happening all over the world. And um, in the Inland County area of Norway, we're talking about more than half of the global finds of this type are. So this is the main hotspot in the world. And that's because there's been a lot of human activity on these sites throughout Mm -hmm. thousands of years in Norway's uh, prehistory. That's fascinating. That that has to be quite bittersweet because I guess the more ice melts, the more exciting it is for you and the more you can find, but also equally, we don't really want it to melt. (laughs) No, and that's uh, something we're very aware of. And uh, you know, it's it's a fun project to work on because, as we'll talk about, these are very exceptional finds. This is stuff you can't find in other archaeological contexts in Europe, for example. So we see things we've never seen before as uh, archaeologists, and that's super exciting. You know, you, you can't contain that excitement. But at yeah. the same time, we see prehistory melting away. We see it disappear with the melting water faster than we as uh, archaeologists can collect the artifacts and the data. 
um i've i've seen i've found uh stone age sh- arrow shafts floating in meltwater you know if we'd been there wow. 10 minutes later it would have been gone forever and it had been there for over 4000 years so you, you get that sense of urgency mm-hmm. and uh, a bit of kind of like uh, you can feel the sorrow for the disappearing these are geomora these are like landscapes that will be gone in a hundred years we can you won't be able to experience them today yeah or in, in 50 a hundred years you won't be able to see the same landscape that they saw a thousand years ago in the mm-hmm. Viking age or in the Stone Age it will be completely different it will be a landscape without snow and ice mm-hmm. when you say gone forever why why would that if it's in in the melted water is it because it's so old it will just disintegrate well, or then it, well first of all in the melt water will just float away into a river or into a stream into a river into a lake into the sea and be gone right? okay. um and of course uh when they're exposed they will uh start deteriorating and that depends on the material for example wood it can handle a bit of weather you know because these have been frozen so they're they're like new so if you okay. have a stick, you know, it can take it, you know, it can lie outside for a couple of weeks without being gone. But if you have leather or wool textiles, they'll just uh, dry up and, and get taken by the wind or crumble to dust under mm-hmm. this uh, the wind and sun. So it varies from uh, material type to material type. But yeah, that's so uh, that is it's extremely fascinating because the amount of stuff that you do find, but then the amount of bits that you must miss. Yeah, so we we have uh, around 60 sites, uh, different sites around the mountain areas that we know have finds. And um, of course, <laughs> and when shit hits the fan, it's always everywhere all at once, you know? So oh, we yeah, know bad, there's yeah. stuff everywhere and you can't, you can't be everywhere because the sites are four or five, six hours away from the closest road and you know so it's just a half a day's work just trying to get there from a road for example so we know this that like we have to prioritize here we go to the sites where we think that it's uh, gonna be yeah we'll get most return for our effort so Mm -hmm. places we know have interesting stuff or places we know we have like skipped over a few years and there should be a lot there now so you mean you mean you don't have a helicopter like in all movies with archaeologists? Well, uh, we used to use a little bit of helicopters, but the helicopters are very weather dependent. And this is the high mountains. You know, it's windy, it's foggy, it's uh, snowing, raining. You can't. You can go days without being able to get in with a helicopter. And uh, we're also uh, acutely aware of why the ice patches are melting. Okay. And yeah. so it's it's also a bit of that. But we if we're doing a big base camp, we use pack horses and um uh pack horses are uh, fabulous. They can carry a, a horse can carry up towards a hundred kilos of equipment. Wow. Yeah. And they and a horse can walk faster through the mountains uh with a hundred kilos than I can walk, you know. So it gives you that um uh, also something about that you can just move through the landscape as they used to do. And we find lots of uh, horse equipment or, or dead pack horses from the Middle Age, a medieval period, Viking Age, Iron Age. So mm-hmm. we know that they used them too. So something about you get the same feeling of being on the same trip that the, that they, uh, the people we are recovering artifacts mm-hmm. from used. That has to be, it has to be so different to i don't want to be offensive to traditional archaeology but it has to be so different in a sense that you know it's not turning up to a site i mean all sites are different but you could just turn up to a site that's 15 minutes off a road and it's still an amazing thing you can find something that's going to change history forever it's still exciting but i'm but for you to get there it has to be an an adventure in itself before you're even at the site and then looking for these these amazing yeah. items. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, I also do normal excavations, 
uh, as part of my part of my job. And, they, and you know, it's okay. You know, drive up to the side, get out of the car with a coffee yeah. in your hand, and you know, just enjoy normal archaeology digging something. Yeah. But this is, you know, um, for anybody who's seen pictures of our work. You know, it, it looks like a mountain expedition. It feels like a mountain expedition. You're if you get wet, you know you're going to be wet for days because you know it won't dry. Or mm -hmm. um, at least if your shoes get wet, because you know oh. don't bring an extra pair of shoes. Oh. But so there's something about that. But that's I don't know for most of us that um, that have done it for several years. I guess that's part of the uh, the allure. You know, we mm -hmm. after like four weeks, you're like, oh. I'm never going to do this again. That this is the last year. That's enough. And then two days later, it's like, uh, should we go back soon? You know, yeah. you get this kind of addiction to like the uh, to the experience, as yeah, yeah. many probably explorers throughout history have felt. You know, it wasn't it was hard work, and it didn't always feel good. But in hindsight, you want to do it more. Mm -hmm. I think that's that rings true for most experiences that are really worthwhile doing that sometimes in the moment you hate it and you're like i'll never do this again i mean i wonder how many mothers during childbirth have said fuck this i'm never yeah. having another kid and then once you know after it settled down yeah like ah, oh, that wasn't too bad i'll <laughs> let's have another one <laughs> so it, it, it's that similar sort of thing you know you forget the, the struggles after and you just yeah. enjoy the the really nice memories for it yeah. So how um, long do you, uh, sorry, I was going to say, um, how long do you, how long do you stay up there for? Well, it varies from the site to site and this uh, year to year, we know, because we have many sites, so we kind of have to spread the time, but usually our, our main field work time frame for field work here is like August, beginning of September. So that would be like six weeks ish okay. that we like that's what we have set off the time to do the field work on it and um and then you know some sites we'll spend a week at some places two or three days some places we'll just go in and out as as a as a as a strike force you know just mm -hmm. five guys in check it out for a day and then out again you know we okay. we'll spent 40 now 14 hours walking around the mountains but uh, you you get a picture of how, what's going on. So um, so usually we do two larger surveys a season. So like two separate sites where you maybe spend a, a, a week-ish. And then uh, the rest of the time is like uh, day trips or two or three nights in a tent, checking uh, different areas. What, what a fun job. Yeah. <laughs> what a fascinating life. That yeah. is, is is it just is it just one team that does the different sites, or, or do you have multiple teams that go to different sites at the same time? Uh, we split up sometimes. It depends, you know. It, it's been it's, things have changed from year to year, and the program's been going for over ten years. So we've we've tried a lot of different stuff. So we we could just have to decide from year to year what what seems uh, beneficial at the moment mm -hmm. or in the moment so i um maybe i haven't quite set the scene for everybody listening maybe of why there's so many artifacts in the high mountains oh yeah i, think I, we, I could I, keep talking about how cool it is all day so <laughs> <laughs> please yeah. please do that yeah this is in an outdoor podcast i said Pardon? No, no, I said this isn't like an outdoor experience podcast. Like we're not a hiking podcast. No, no, no. <laughs> so we should do some. No, we, but the uh, we've been talking about all these finds, but there's there's a reason they're there, of course, and that is um, mainly reindeer hunting. So uh, in uh, in Norway, there there is wild reindeer, and of course, there was a lot of wild reindeer throughout prehistory, and in the summer. The reindeers need somewhere to escape from the heat and especially insects that are um, very nasty. We have, there's a type of uh, a fly here that will they will land on the reindeer and bore under their skin and lay eggs. The eggs of the fly will be underneath the reindeer skin. Mm -hmm. uh, seems uh, excruciatingly 
uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, what a what a evil thing to do. Jeez. Anyway, these uh, flies they cannot fly over snow. Okay, uh, right. The air is too cold, so they they will just fall to the to the ground. Wow. And th- this this is something that the reindeer obviously know. So they will they will graze down in the valleys uh, at, from like late evening and night, early morning in the summer, and then they'll buy and then they'll pull up into the mountainsides throughout the day in the summer to stand on the snow and ice to avoid these insects and to escape the heat. And this is a very predictable uh, behavior. And we know hunters have been exploiting this since the Stone Age and uh, and forwards. So that's, they could just, they knew where the reindeer would be in the middle of the day. They didn't have to like walk around and try to stalk them and, and, and follow the herd. They knew where the herd would be in the middle of the day. So mm-hmm. it's, it's like setting an ambush. Wow. So that's one of the reasons why we have a lot of finds. And the other is that some of these sites were mountain passes that we used in in um, in prehistory. From uh, yeah, some of them the well, most well documented one we have at Lenven. It gets they start using it in the Roman period, mm-hmm. and uh, it has its uh, sees the most amount of traffic through the Viking Age, and then it's in use in, through the the medieval period, and then but it stopped being used before the historic uh, the written sources. So it disappeared some time after the the plague. Mm-hmm. Do we know what the landscape would have been like? Obviously, we're mainly a Viking Age podcast. So, yeah. what would it have been like a thousand years ago? And obviously, you're I, you know you're looking for anything up there. I presume from yeah. any time period. So, do we know how much it would have changed throughout history as well? Well, these these sites will, of course. Uh, uh, fluctuate in size, the, like the at least the snow around them, because these sites they consist of like a, a core of ice, and then the snow that will vary from season to season. So um, uh, maybe the Viking Age would have seen them as we saw them twenty years ago. So okay. like like not like massively different, yeah, but but different still. But you know so. So we know, but they chose to use these mountain passes because there was snow and ice there. Because uh, this is a very high friction landscape. There's just rock, you know. There's no soil or anything. So you're just walking on scree, huge boulders. You know, it, it it just takes a lot of time to plod through these boulder fields. But if you have a nice compact snow, it's like walking on a highway, and that's why we've sometimes called mm-hmm. it like the Viking Highway in the mountains because you just get it the same as us doing the field work you just get onto that hard packed summer snow that's melted down and frozen a bit and then you can just walk if like it's pavement wow so, so would that be similar i'm putting it to my experiences when you when you go walking through woodland and obviously there is one path that everybody's taken and you just have a clear path through with kind of just soil rather than trees and brambles and bushes yeah. and everything else so that w- that would be like the the easiest route to use crossing uh, like so if you're crossing like a mountain pass and there's somewhere where there's a snow field like or a snow a gully with snow fastest is always kind of just to walk on that and follow it okay uh, so so this um so this is like the the easiest route to take the least cost okay that leads me on to what kind of footwear I don't know whether I assume that's something you would probably know because yeah. you know I'm always thinking of those little ones that are like tennis shoes. That's yeah. my image of what they would have on their feet. Yeah, so we have found several shoes in these mountain passes, and for example, two Viking Age shoes. I uh, I almost stepped on one once by accident. You know that's <laughs> okay. That's how we you know because everything is just melted out onto the ground from the ice. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's no soil in it like a normal excavation. So, mm. but anyway, so it is a it's a hide like if you like imagine like a leather shoe or or a hide shoe, it is pretty much what it is. But these um shoes that we find on these sites, 
the interesting part is uh, so there are there are untanned hides and um they have uh, sewn them so that the uh the, um, the fur of the reindeer that they were made of is uh, out so the fur is on the outside of the shoe oh wow i i was 100 percent sure you were gonna say on the inside then no no it's on the outside because that means it's just like for anybody familiar with uh alpine skiing for example where you have uh, skins under your under your um, skis so that you okay. don't you can you you won't slide backwards it's like uh, it's like wearing crampons okay or 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 studs under your mm-hmm. under your shoes so they 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 knew this that they were probably going to cross the ice and uh, or snow and then they wanted footwear with traction on them Wow. So they have specific, or it's not if they were specifically made for this, but they have the shoes, what we find on these sites, definitely are optimized for this environment. I uh, imagine it's a trial and error thing. And over time, they've just figured out this yeah. is the, the best way yeah. to do it. Yeah. And of course, we also find um, snowshoes for horses. Uh, like, so big, like 50s, centimeters in diameters round uh, um they're made of like a, uh, like a it's like a birch frame kind of thing so that the with the um, wifey bindings in the middle so that the horses would get more or what would you say <laughs> they won't step through the snow you know with yeah so they have more feet. surface area yeah so they have more surface areas so we found the oldest ones of these are from the roman period like 200 a.d or at least the third century sometime. So we like we know that they also had a, a squi- equipment for crossing the snow f- for their pack animals. Mm-hmm. And we also f- have found skis, uh, of course, as well. As, so they they had the, the equipment for crossing these kinds of uh, places. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're clearly well-equipped for being up there. It's not a one-off occurrence. It's something that they have learn over time to to acclimatize to being up there and adapt and yeah and we've seen you know some of these so for like the hunting sites we can see they've been in continual use for around six thousand years and the mountain pass at Lenben that we've just been talking about is it was used uh, for like 11 like 1100 years as okay. like as we can see it's like that's consecutive use you know it's been wow. if it wasn't every year it was at least almost every year and there are thousands of artifacts just melting out of that one site with the beyond, beyond most archaeologists wildest dreams so if, if they because i guess looking at it from a, a modern mind i can't imagine humans hunting a, a single place for a thousand years and not over hunting it to the point where it becomes worthless anymore so i guess that means that they must have had a an uh, some eye maybe on conservation of the idea of the if we hunt this too much then they're not going to be here anymore or was it just a case that they didn't need that many well it's, yeah it be, because i can yeah it's it's like, it's probably like a case between how much you can feasibly get with the available technology, for example, of a bow, bow and arrow, mm-hmm. versus how much you actually need and how much because or how much time you have to spend at it, and what the market is, for example, for this this um, for a, a given product. But what we can say and what we know about reindeer hunting in what the, like the 13th century, so that's like the medieval period in Norway. Mm-hmm. So we see like from the late Viking age, an uptick in the intensity in reindeer hunting. And uh, through the genetic makeup of of the like retrieved antlers and bones, we can see that there's a genetic bottleneck in the 13th century. And that tells us they, they have decimated the reindeer population to a degree where it's becoming genetically unviable as a population. So oh, okay. they they almost... They almost eradicate the wild reindeer through commercial hunting in the early wow. medieval period. Do we know Norway. why that is? Did did reindeer hide become super popular? The uh, the commodity is antler, and okay. uh, that is for making combs. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so we know this was exported through like all around the North Sea from, um, from for example, Norway. And that's because people started living in urban areas. And, you know, for example, in Den- like Iriba or the, the early urban centers in England mm-hmm. uh, or York, for example, you know, and there would be lice. Yeah. So much lice. And then you want the fine combs okay. and that. Uh, and, the, and um, you know, this is in a time before plastic. Yeah. But uh, anther, uh, you know, you have the, it ends up being a type of plastic. You can just carve, saw it up and carve it up and then make very nice combs. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, that mention of lice just gave me a little shiver. <laughs> Looking yeah. at me and you with, with beards and yeah, uh, just, just, uh, oh. yeah. So so that's you see. So that's what happens, kind of. I guess in the um, late Viking age, mm-hmm. uh, like if and then for the early medieval period in Norway, is mm-hmm. is that you get the markets, you get you have a market for it, and you have the means to do it through yeah. uh, mass hunting trapping systems okay. so that so that's so we kind of uh, so this is of course archaeology around the whole uh, glacial archaeology thing like we excavate other sites that gives us a lot of this information about the hunting mm-hmm. but the nice thing about these um, these ice sites is that we have preserved antler and bone as well you know so we get a lot more genetic data points on uh, on reindeer mm-hmm. from uh, from the period do you get any finished products or are you just finding the raw antler because i guess why would they take now, a... this all, at these sites this is like the raw yeah and of course we can find some objects made of uh of antler and bone of course you know as they would have lots of this in their mm-hmm. possession anyway but also um reindeer they shed their antlers annual anyway mm-hmm. so there there was a lot of it floating around in the mountains yeah but on these sites they will just be preserved by the same means that Mm -hmm. the uh, artifacts are you know so we we find a lot of naturally shed out there but this they give some give the same genetic information and and uh, natural history information uh, Mm -hmm. as what the stuff that's butchered by humans yeah for example that's why i was a little bit surprised you said that it was due to antler because i was thinking they do shed them naturally so surely it would make more sense to keep them alive and let them keep shedding rather than well well this is also you're you're getting close to to the period where you get um uh domesticated reindeer yeah that happens is some some place in in the same time frame in, in further north in norway so you, you're you're touching into like same the same um, the, or the concepts around around that, but of course you know it's not they just didn't kill take the antlers and then dump the rest. No, you know they kept the skins were used for something, the bones were used for something, the meat uh, you know mm-hmm. sinews and and we find you know they used the sinews for for example when they were making arrows you know they had to wrap the um, the haftings. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the arrow point, you know, it's it's glued in there, but they wrap it with sinew as well, for example. So so it's a, it's a total package. But uh, when we're talking about the external markets, it would be the um, okay. uh, anthers and probably fur, furs as well. But anthers yeah. are very easy to trace because they preserve well mm-hmm. in the archaeological record. For okay, example, yeah. in urban uh, places. Okay. So that's. Uh, easy to talk about yeah absolutely so we were speaking before the podcast a little bit and you mentioned about how glacial archaeology gives you better um access to i guess organic finds something that you don't usually get with traditional archaeology yeah so that's the i guess that's like the main attraction of all these finds and why i guess lots of people like enjoy following our work on social media and that is since these artifacts are lost on ice and snow or they they get encapsulated in ice that means that there's uh there's no breakdown of the organic material 
wood is preserved, clothing is preserved, anything that's made of an organic material is preserved. And this is, you know, rare for other archaeological sites, such as the burial mound. You, in lucky circumstances, you might get something, but mostly if you excavate a Viking grave in, in for example, Norway, you'll find metals, stone, and pottery. You know, that's, you know, a lot of people mm -hmm. will, that's what we, um, you know, our archaeology is like the history of pottery, really, you know, it's, yeah. there's a lot of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so for example, uh, otherwise, you know, if you find an arrow or if you're talking about an arrow in an archaeological sense, you often just really mean the arrowhead. Mm -hmm. But in our instances, when we're talking about an arrow, we're talking about an arrowhead made of metal or stone, but then there's a 60, 70 centimeters of arrow shaft made of wood. And then on that shaft, you also have arrow feathers for the fletching. Wow. Uh, and then they have been glued in place with birch tar. And then they've been and you can you can find the, yeah, yeah the tar wow. is still there. And then and then the the the, um, the feathers have been tied into the tar with linen string and the uh, and on the uh, by the uh, and the uh, arrow point has been uh, what is tightened in with the sinew you know so you suddenly have uh, it's, it's, it's an object that has uh, five or six components and normally you just find one of them and then suddenly you have all of it yeah. and then you multiply this by hundreds of um, hundreds of objects thousands of objects and you suddenly get an insight into things you couldn't do research on or tell people about. For example, about that the, they had the fur turned out on the shoes mm -hmm. or that they had uh, snowshoes for their horses. Yeah. Or or that we find um, uh, everyday, um, everyday objects that we've never seen before from certain time periods that we can suddenly, you know, discuss uh, the background for, uh, for example, uh, we find dairy equipment on some of the sites. Mm -hmm. uh, and why were they there? Because they, they obviously must have been going somewhere where they were going to do something with dairy products. Mm -hmm. And then um, we find pieces of clothing or complete clothing. Like we found a Roman age tunic, which is like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, it's kind of unheard of. It's hard to like yeah. maybe put into words how strange that is to find a complete yeah, well, tunic that is one thousand seven hundred years old just lying there intact. Oh, that, yeah, that has to be insane because you know one of the hardest things to find preserved is fabric and clothing. Yeah. You you see you, anybody who goes you know frequents museums, you always tend to see anything when it comes to fabric. You find. Yeah. Like something that's maybe like a couple of inches square, if that, yeah. and like that's all they have to find a complete piece must be, you know, it's unheard, like a, it's unheard of. Yeah. You know, this is a piece of clothing that it would, um, in theory, uh, I could have put it on. And most likely it would, you know, it might even, it would have survived me draping it over myself. Oh, okay. Really? So it was, it was in, and in, that, I wouldn't take a jog around in it, but you know, it, it, you know, it, it's not fault. You can, you could. It's like, not going to just fall apart if you no, touch it. it. It's not like uh, it doesn't just fall apart if you touch it. Or we found like a, a mitten from the Viking age. You know, it's just it's just lying there over a rock, like somebody was holding onto the rock. You know, oh and and that's, I don't think I've stopped smiling this whole episode yet. I find <laughs> this this is so fascinating. And to these me. are you know like there have been a few mittens found you know there's mm -hmm. like a site in iceland where there's a couple of mittens from the viking age and, yeah. and stuff like that but you're into like the the one-off type of discoveries you know you can like say oh yeah we found one of those once somewhere in europe kind of mm -hmm. category of, of finds yeah like we've we've recovered a, a complete ski pair from uh from the 8th century like that's not something that usually happens no, no. you know and i guess when you 
it's one thing finding a fragment of something and then speculating on the complete piece and the size of the person, for example. Whereas if you find the complete piece, you can say, well, this person was like, with much more accuracy, like there was likely this tall, this this size. It gives you a much better... Of course it does. And, um, and it, it, that's, of course, a, a fun thing. You know, you can like, you see the size of the shoes, you know, and then you'll easily say what size the feet must have been to like wear them. And this is stuff that, you know, of course has happened um a year has been possible in like medieval urban centers where you have deep cultural layers where you have like several meters of organic waste that it's uh, preserving itself sort of but for example our oldest shoe is from the middle of the bronze age mm -hmm. so it's uh three and a half ooh, yeah three and a yeah close to three and a half thousand years old you know so it's like two and a half thousand years older than the stuff from the medieval towns mm -hmm. and it's like okay but he wore the person whoever that they were they had like something close to size 39 you know in a european size shoe okay it's like, I, I, it's oh, like I, the details i don't know what that is in british sizes we use a, a so i'm yeah. sure somebody in the chat will let me know <laughs> yes Just... yeah but i don't know maybe in the u.s like it's Seven and a half, maybe for men, something like. That. Yeah, we use a yeah. similar similar yeah. size. But so uh, do you, you know that would like say thirty nine? That would be like a small man's feet mm. or a big women's feet today. You know yeah. that that crossover section. Do you see a big difference in size from three and a half thousand years ago to a thousand years ago? And I guess no, you can't would, really we, say who's wearing it either. No, uh, we don't have you know we are not we don't have that kind of statistics to. Uh, <laughs> to lean on if you want to you know we have a couple of shoes you know it wouldn't yeah. be enough to say it, it's not a big data pool but jimmy no, says that they're his size so yeah. maybe he can borrow them to go out go out on the town in yeah <laughs> so uh uh of course that's a lot of fun and um but you know a lot of the prehistory can feel a bit impersonal when you're out or if you're excavating uh, artifacts or or sites, or if you're in a museum, you know, you don't always, it's just stuff lying there. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I feel that like with these uh, well-preserved organic finds, it's easier to kind of feel that you're closer or there's something about the connection yeah. feels and everything feels more normal. It feels like my stuff. Well, yeah, when uh, you, I, you know, it, when you find... Like again, you know, when you're finding fragments of things, you have to use a degree of imagination to complete it and then picture who who wore it. But when you find a glove holding a rock and you could probably almost go and put your own hand in it, yeah. that has to just bring the all to life so much more. Yeah, uh, it certainly does. And, you know, the tunic I was talking about, somebody, they, they spilled glue on it, like a birch bark tar on their shirt. You know, you can't oh. get it out again because like tars are just like, you just, you can like, you know, they were cursing that day. I bet their wife was so mad at them. And uh, we find arrows that have had their shafts repaired, you know, like ad hoc repairs, mm -hmm. you know, that it's like, oh shit, that broke. You know, you just have to fix it because you're out hunting. It's hu uh, it's very human. It's, yeah. it's humanizing. Or just yeah. the feeling of losing your sh mitten in the middle of the mountains you know you know you're you know you're having a not the best day and yeah. um and so one of my personal favorites is we found uh this is at like two thousand meters above sea level uh, in the mountain pass uh, we found a toy arrow so you what, know you like their kids there what's a what's a toy arrow a toy arrow no yeah but what, what would be a toy arrow oh what? yeah it's the size you know this is only like 30 centimeters long it's just a miniature it's it's just a scale down um okay the normal arrow is just made for a size that wouldn't be dangerous for an animal of course you know so it's just it's just a toy and it's it's a blunt you know it's a, has a blunt mm -hmm. end instead of a sharp one so wow. they just uh so you can, you can just imagine you know all the people like the like family groups extended family you know going somewhere and just like 
losing stuff. <laughs> oh yeah. And, uh, and yeah, that would be me as a kid. And my mom and dad would be furious at me for losing my toy arrow. Yeah. For losing my toy arrow and my, and my mitten. Cause I was trying to pick up a fancy rock. Yeah. So what was the, what was the mitten made of? It's made of a wool. Okay. Uh, so that it's, um, it's made of wool, sheep's wool. So it's it's woven uh, in two pieces and kind of just sewn together and then with a thumb on it. It's, it's quite <laughs> quite simple. But yeah, nothing nothing too remarkable except no, it being really, really old. It's being old. And, you know, some of the other mittens from the same era found elsewhere in Northern Europe, they've been needle bound instead of woven. So, it's, you know, it's not shocking. It's just different. Mm-hmm. Do you do we ever find them with fingers in, or is that just a purely modern? Uh, so so this gloves exist, like yeah, other places in the archaeological record. We see the gloves. This isn't my expert mm-hmm. field of expertise, but I'm pretty sure there. Are, I I I can recall gloves being found in the first millennium, otherwhere in Europe in in certain graves finds, for example, where because leather is preserved more often than for example textiles so like leather gloves have been found of course okay so a glove is in a, in a completely modern mm-hmm. they've been around for 2000 years at least and oh, wow. probably more for all okay. i know you know yeah yeah or i i, I can't say for sure i no, just no. know that they're they're, I, they're I can, old they're old <laughs> yeah um how does it compare to like bog body like things are preserved in bogs yeah so so superficially it seems the same but the difference between wood uh, preserved in bogs and wood preserved in ice is that the um the uh wood preserved in ice has retained its structural integrity wood preserved in bogs you can squish it and it's like a sponge you know it looks fine but it's not you know there's nothing okay like the, the wood structure, the cell structure in the wood is gone. You know, it's just water keeping its shape. Yeah, I'm guessing moisture is just... Yeah, so if you it. find like 2,000-year-old wood preserved in a bog, you can take your hand and you can squeeze it and you'll probably... Mm-hmm. It's like touching a sponge. I've excavated that kind of stuff before. Yeah. But the uh, the uh, stuff from the ice, you know, it's, it's been frozen. It's like keeping it in your own freezer. And um, yeah, I'm holding a piece of a bow in my hand right now. I don't know if you can you hear the tapping sound. Uh, go, no, I think your uh, your yeah. microphone was somewhere. My, somewhere else. I don't know where the microphone is right, or maybe it's just the filter. Or yeah, the it's, not, it's not but picking it, it up. I no. believe you though; it looks pretty sturdy. Anyway, you know, it's 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 as if you left it yeah. three days ago in the sun. You know, that's that's all. How old's that piece of bow that you're just tapping around casually? <laughs> it's um. Uh, uh, 11 yeah it's, it's about eight, 800 years old <laughs> and you're i mean and you're just tapping it away just get trying to give you an experience it's <laughs> like the it's hard, you can't show anything on a podcast you just kind of want to <laughs> yeah, yeah no i mean but, you can there, no, but there, that was a part of a, a laminated bow from the yeah. uh, medieval period people you can hold things up if you if you have anything people can watch this on youtube as well yeah so. They can see the the nice boat the yeah. So the wood is preserved as if it was made yesterday, and yeah. the same with the iron is perfectly preserved because there's nothing for it to corrode with. Like iron found in soil, you know, sometimes it's just a heap of corrosion that has to be cleaned up, and you can barely touch it without it turning to dust. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here, you know, there's been nothing for it to corrode with. There are no salts in the eye like like there is in the earth. So. So the uh, the iron is is perfectly preserved as well. Yeah. So it's uh, it's a completely different world. Uh, that's so, so. What about when it comes to people? I'm sure there must be bodies up there. Have you found anything like that? I think for me, the first ever interaction or like knowledge of glacial archaeology was Ertzi. You know, I guess yep. the the most famous. 
uh, yeah. what would what would you call it? The what would you what would you call that kind of body that's found up there? Is there, a, is there a, an ice a, mummy kind of? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, so I'd say you know it's definitely the most famous. And, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's famous no matter what kind of prehistoric context you're talking about. It's just an amazing find. You know, there's yeah. just so much there, and it's just it's so old and it's everything. But, um, so that that's really cool, but uh, we Do you have your own Etsy. I guess is no, what I was we, asking. we haven't. We have unfortunately we have not found our own uh, deceased person. Maybe okay. someday we will, you know. But the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of chance going into somebody dying on the spot and not being retrieved by. Okay. Yeah. By other, but we see you know other people have lost their horses on the ice. We found a dog, you know, with his collar and leash still. So, you know, there's always, you know, chances are that it can happen, but, you know, mm-hmm. it's just. Uh, it has to be that. Yeah. They have to die, you know, at the right time. Like they have to die within like ob- above the ice core and they have to die at the right time of year. And because there are, of course, scavengers, you know, like wolverines in the mountains, mm-hmm. you know, so if there's just a dead body lying around for several weeks or months you know they, they'll just get eaten up by animals so you kind of have to die and then get quickly covered by snow <laughs> so there's a lot of uh ifs going into mm-hmm. actually uh, finding a, a preserved human within yeah. the ice Did- but it can happen you know there's been one an example of this in canada as well mm-hmm. uh, this- as a similar to etsy okay would they uh, so we'll, i presume people would have died up there um you know it's a harsh environment i i can't imagine for a second that it wouldn't have happened no. so w- do you think that they would have taken them with them yeah for because because again you know it's it is a harsh environment it's it adding to your workload having to as cruel as it sounds pull a pull a dead person with you yeah but yeah they probably would have you know the off chance that somebody passed away i uh I I guess they would have taken them along. You know, we know a lot about mortuary practices in, for example, the Iron Age, Viking Age. You know, they've gone through, they've gone to lengths, you know, to bury people in specific places with a lot of stuff. And, you know, they've spent a lot of energy on burials in these societies. So it doesn't seem like a lot of work to carry somebody three or four or five hours hours down from a mountain, you know. Mm -hmm on top of all the other things they chose to do to yeah. um, to honor the dead. So you, you mentioned about a dog. Now, yeah. I anybody that knows me, I love dogs. Yeah. So do we know, first, I guess, what kind of dog it, it was? Um, what was, what would the leash, well, you said it had like a collar and a lead on, which, yeah. which I found fascinating as well. Well, I assume that's probably leather. No, actually no? not. It's not leather. Oh, okay. No. I'm always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we don't know what uh, type of dog it is yet. Uh, the the bones are at a DNA analysis analysis right now. Oh, but, uh, you're muted again. I think I dropped my keyboard and I hit the wrong button. So is this a recent found find? Uh, no, it's it's a couple of years ago, but you know. It's, some things take time and then you have to find somebody that's willing to do the analysis and stuff. But uh, we know that, you know, the dog was, um, was about half a meter tall, uh, at the shoulders, you know, based on the bones, it was a male okay. dog. It had, um, broken bones that had healed. Oh, wow. Uh, it had eaten fish, uh, among its last meals because, you know, bones in the stomach. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so is that, is that similar as with Earth Six, I know one of the, the big things about that was that you could see, you know, the contents of his stomach and his last meal. Do you get that the same with the horses and the dogs? And can you get an idea of, I guess, of their diet? Uh, well, it's not the same. The, these the, For this dog, it was like the actual gut kind of are, is gone. But, you know, there's still just were fish bones within the ribs, you know, you know. They, okay you know it was preserved that way but in the horses we have all the ex we have tons of horse droppings on the site because you know they've been walking hundreds and hundreds of horses back and forth on this mm-hmm. uh, on this mountain route and they have 
you know, as horses do, taking a dump wherever they were. Oh, uh, they do, yes. And then <laughs> so on on big meltiers were literally wading through the stuff. You know, you got a, a level of of uh, horse droppings that are just, you know, there are a thousand years. There's like hundreds of years of horse droppings melting out <laughs> of the ice at once, and it smells like it. Oh, re- it still smells. Yeah, it, it it isn't like a harsh smell, but it's like, oh, this is uh, this is uh, this isn't good. But it's still uh, wow. Yeah. So then you can see, of course, what the horses have been eating through pollen and macrofossils and stuff within the droppings. Mm-hmm. So there's, um, of course, information in that too. So we get it, you know, we get a big like we can piece together all these kind of things, so we know kind of what, at what time of year they were using the mountain pass and what they were transporting through it, and uh, and like the Lembran site we were talking about, they were transporting, they were crossing it from the early summer and onwards in the season, mm-hmm. and they were transporting as we said like i mentioned like equipment for dairy production you don't need that in the top of the mountains why is that there why is there toys there uh why is there so much textile there's like there's there's containers there's beeswax there's just everything that a normal household would need and they were going somewhere and you know it took a while for us to realize how much there actually was and 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 that it was more first we just thought it was hunting equip hunters that had lost some equipment but then it was like no no this is something else mm-hmm. this is something more why is there thousands of objects at this site okay and you know you, okay they were going somewhere because they weren't going here this isn't mm-hmm. the equipment for going here they were just passing by so so, you, so when you said a mountain pass i kind of just assumed it was a path between two villages maybe yeah well, yeah and we know that today we didn't you know kind of we're jumping back and forth in our own story you know we didn't know that until okay we yeah. discovered it to be that mm-hmm. so, so uh, as so after you know realizing this was you know a mountain pass you know where was it going and then we started working our way down the other side of the mountain because there wasn't any known prehistoric village or or site dwelling site there wasn't a known one you know but so we started following down and there and you know there were, then then you notice there were like a lot of cairns and there were well-worn paths that weren't in use anymore uh, and uh, following this we ended up uh, at a site called at a, or getting close to a, a, a modern summer farm area called Netu. And um, there wasn't anything known archaeological sites there, but there was like a, a local legend about that there had been something there before that was gone. And uh, and then lo and behold, our um, one of our team members actually discovered house ruins, uh, several of them wow. beneath you know all the juniper that is. Uh, so this is, you know, a hundred meters further up into like the mountain than the the existing summer farms today. So it's, it's not an area in use anymore. But you know, he and after some surveying, you know, we uh, found uh, I think it was twenty one house ruins. You know, and so we it's, it's not a small. No, this it's... isn't small, and we didn't we didn't know. You know, it couldn't be sure how old it was. Maybe it was just like from the sixteen hundreds. For all we know at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, you know, they had the vibe of could being from the Iron Age, Viking Age, like similar to other places we'd seen, but there aren't that many, you know, usually. But we decided to do a text, test excavation of a few of them to get uh, samples for, for carbon dating. And we did a bit of excavating and we, and we, it felt good because we didn't find any modern stuff or anything that was typically in use, medieval or renaissance or or later periods you know like uh, brick or clay pipes and stuff that is ubiquitous for that time period um and yeah we carbon dated several of them and they were from the viking age you know it was like this unbelievable feeling kind of that you started to piece together 
first it was like an unknown mountain pass. Then you kind of find this unknown village mm-hmm. in the mountains. There's just, you're opening up a whole uh, uh, piece of history that you had no, you know, you could have like guessed that it was there or that they did this kind of stuff. But now you suddenly have, you've populated the high mountains in yeah. the Iron Age, Viking Age with lots of people, lots of activity. Uh, so we, perhaps, you know, when you're looking at a mountain area now, you think, oh, this is pristine nature. Man hasn't done much here. But that now we see like they've just, there have been people everywhere up here. Mm-hmm. They've been hunting reindeer. They've been quarrying rock. They've been moving goods. You know, there's pretty much just the major highway going over the mountain because it would be easier than walking down in the forested valley. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that, you know, that's, then you're getting into like the, the history on a bigger scale, you know, not just like cool finds and and uh, one-off wonders of of things to learn, but you suddenly you're building a history, a synthesis of of the past in the mountains. Yeah, well, it's changing what people's opinions are and what people think they did and where they think that they lived. To yeah, it's, 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 it's opening it all up. Um, yeah, that has they, to be very and how willing and able they were to, to utilize this landscape to yeah. a very large extent. It's just not hunting groups going up, getting game, and then going back down again. It's like mm-hmm. you're actively using the whole area with lots yeah. of people throughout the summer months. Okay. To, to I guess to clear this up in, in my mind and maybe other people's listening, when, when we were talking Mountain Pass before, I was – kind of thinking you had a village below the ice, just, you know, regular village height, you know, just where it's nice and green. And yeah. then you would use the mountain pass to pass through the mountains to another village that is at regular height in the green yeah. normal. So it's not actually up in the snow and the ice. It's just like a it, an easier way to get to that other village is to go through yeah. the mountains rather than going around the mountain. But what you're saying is that there was a settlement actually up in... So, for example, and now we're ice. talking about like the normal village would be, you know, uh, in, the, in the in the bottom of the valley, you know, three, four hundred meters above sea level. Yeah. And then they crossed over the mountain, 2,000 meters above sea level, and then on the other side of the mountain, they went to, uh, down to. Though now we're talking about a a vill or a site settlement site village somewhere they spent time in the summer, that is around a thousand meters, eleven hundred meters. So you're talking about where the tree line is. Wow. So it's it's uh, so it's not from one village to another, but it's from a uh, from a village or settlement area over the mountain and then a little bit down on the other side to where they would have their animals grazing in the summer. Mm-hmm. And there was other resources to, um, there's, we know there's like a quarry there for soapstone and then we would have lots of uh, goods related to hunting activities. So it's like a, it seems like a hub of trade and hunting and uh, dairy uh, farming. So it was it was a proper little settlement settlement. It wasn't just a. I don't, I don't think it wasn't like a, we're now the the Nectu at a thousand meters above the sea level. We're not. I don't think we're talking about a permanent like year round settlement site. Okay. But something that would be like a seasonal site where you'd go, you know, at the end, uh, like at, at the end of May, beginning of June, you know, when the snow would disappear from that area. Mm-hmm. And then in, into through August, for example, you know, because mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I like, was thinking yeah, maybe yeah. it was somewhere where the hunters would stay for yeah, as temporary well. for maybe like a week or whatever, yeah. and then the the do the, the hunt, and yeah. then when they got enough, they would then go back to the to the main. But it seems like it's more permanent than yeah, that, at least. So, so it would it probably most a lot of it would probably function like. Uh, summer farms and uh, shillings have worked in up until recent times they would take um there are they like goats and uh, cows and sheep up to like the summer pastures 
because then they could graze on the on the grass in the mountains and then they would milk them and they would make dairy products in the mountain like for example well cheese is so that they can transport them out you know so that you can and that means you don't deplete your resources in the valley so it's like moving your animals to uh so you're using areas that aren't available the rest of the year in the summer so you don't deplete your resources or feed for animals in the uh in the autumn or spring or, or winter. Okay, because that was going to be my next question was what would be the point of of making this long journey yeah. with with all your animals to keep them? But yeah. it's I guess it's like a a farm away from the yeah. main settlement where you they can would would the yeah. it's it's um, that is exactly what it is. It's kind of like your it's, that's why it's called the summer farm. You have your your main settlement site, but then you can move parts of your of your livestock to somewhere else mm-hmm. uh, and and deplete the the grazing resources there for the season and then that's why it's a lot done this with the uh, dairy production because then while the animals are up there you can still milk them you can make cheeses and then you can transport the cheeses back to to the main areas or or sell it and mm-hmm. and so forth would they i mean i don't know if you know the answer to this would they bring the animals back each year or would they? Yeah, yeah. They'd, they'd move the animals back and forth. So they'd come back each year. And yeah. then, mm. so have you found any sort of domesticated farm animals on the way? Uh, maybe we think so, but I, not to, yeah, we're still working on some of it, you know, to be, um, sure enough to want to publish this you know there's a there's a scale of how okay. I'm sure you're about it it's things but we certainly do find a lot of uh, specialized equipment for for uh, for transporting animals for example we mm-hmm. find them um, uh, like leaf fodder so they brought uh food for the animals while crossing the mountains okay and the the equipment for moo or uh, like sticks that are kind of made for herding and uh and that those kind of like all the details you kind of need to uh, to to execute such a maneuver of moving a herd of animals from one place to another. Mm. Another. You know, I I absolutely love episodes like this because it makes me remember that people. Cause I think it's easy to forget that people a thousand years ago was they were still you know they they were humans and they they're not just the they're not just uneducated because i think it's easy to think of us us today as being these highly educated beings you know we can google anything at the touch of a button and pretty much find out most things yeah it takes a degree of research but you can get a decent understanding of most things um and so you kind of look back at people's in history has been a little bit stupid or not knowing as much. So that's kind of like a, a very broad way to put it. Yeah. So I think, you know, episodes like this really make me stop thinking like that. And I'm like, you know, this is, it's insane that, that, that they took this journey with not just to go hunting, but they were taking a, a whole bunch of animals up there. They had to take enough supplies there to make sure that not only they were, safe for the journey but they had to make sure the animals could make the journey yeah. and then transport all the things that they made back so yeah. you know this had to be a very frequent back and forth yeah. and you know it's it's high scale kind of agriculture and it's is fascinating yeah that it is it, it puts it kind of in your face you know when you have this these types of uh sights and experiences that it's it's just there and they were uh, they were just doing so much more than uh, sitting in their halls mm-hmm. made a, uh, and building burial mounds you know there's yeah. there's a lot of activity going on everywhere and they and they were more than happy to to go places all the time you know what <laughs> this just made me think of that every time every time like a a a Viking TV show or movie comes out and it's, 
it's out there. It's very barbaric. And then if you look in the comments, people always say, well, you wouldn't really want to see a film about the Viking Age because it's just farmers doing farming stuff and it's quite boring. But then you tell me stories like this and I'm like, no, they could do a really cool story about something like this because, yeah. you know, that it's it's fascinating and it's an interest. I mean, you could make it exciting. But yeah. the fact that, because again, it's probably my own prejudice, prejudices to a, a degree of, you, you think of farmers from the Viking age, you think of living on a little farmstead and your farm is kind of outside your house, but, and you, you know, and you do your, your farming and you live off the land for you and your family. But this is, you know, this is like, again, it's, it's agriculture on a different scale of taking all these animals off site because it's not going to deplete your resources it's you're thinking further ahead than than now and yeah. it's yeah it's it's absolutely fascinating i i love it i, I I'm, I'm so grateful that you're doing the work yeah well we're having a good time doing it so but you know this all this is going on in a society that is very much into the rest of the what's going on in the viking age you know because the burials in these valleys you know people were put into burial mounds and you have swords and the burials you know they they buried people in the mountains with swords and uh, we found a sword up in them or a, a local reindeer herder found hunter found a viking sword next to one of our sites a couple of years ago just dropped in the mountains and uh you know so it's you know we all of, and from the sagas, some of the sagas like these mountain valleys, right, that I've been talking about that I haven't said any really names on yet, but there are some of them are mentioned in the sagas, you know, as they like um, Saint Olaf came and killed everybody there and burned them, you know, because they didn't want to convert to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they there was fighting and killing here too, but you know that was just part of part of life. But most of life was spent farming, yeah, hunting, buildings. They probably chopped a lot of wood. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I bet. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, or, 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 or or just yeah. yeah, yeah, just like most days were normal days. Yeah, for sure. But but this really puts it into a different for me anyway a different perspective of farming. You know, mm. there's there's farming, and then there's a different because this uh, this is the, the type of farming in in Norway, for example, this part of Norway in the Viking Age is it's not just like tilling the earth day in day out. You know, there's you will have several small fields spread throughout the landscape. You'll have grazing animals at different places, and there will be this whole system. You know, where you're doing a lot of different things mm -hmm. at once. You know, so um, it was probably backbreaking work, but it was. Uh, Oh, I'm sure varied. It was. Probably very yeah. varied. I'm really sure it was. Okay, we're we're over an hour, and I think you know I I feel like we could talk about this, and I feel like you've probably got a, a lot more you could tell us about Definitely. this. Um, so I would I would love if we could book you to come back on in a couple of months. I don't know when it starts getting busy for you again. Well, yeah, we'll. We'll probably right. figure something out and I, then we can talk about something more specific. Yeah, absolutely. But I, you know, when we, when we spoke before, I said, you know, it would be nice to just have a, a mm. quick general chat about what yeah. glacial archaeology was. And then once we started in the first 10 minutes, I'm like, no, this is just going to be pretty much the episode because yeah. this is so fascinating. Um, and, I, and, you know, I'm sure that everybody listening will, will find it fascinating as well, but it would be nice to then, now yeah. we've got now we've got that sword and we can start the next episode with some more specific things. We can just say to people, go back and go back and listen to the other one if you want a, an overview. Now we're gonna get into yeah. some nitty-gritty, as, yeah, as Brits say. Well, there's a lot to say about, for example, if you want to talk about just the Viking Age finds, you know, that that'd be probably two hours in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and you know, I I I probably would happily speak for for the people listening that they would love to explore outside the Viking Age as well because this stuff it really is just so interesting. But yeah, let let's do one on Viking Age 
finds and then we can see where we go from there. But, you know, this was a lot of fun and we're going to do a, a short Q and a after yep. this, uh, where the patrons get to ask you some questions and I've already seen some popping up in the chat. I've had some sent to me, so that's going to be, be a lot of fun. If you do want to hear more from Julian, just if you support us on Patreon at any level, you get access to a bonus episode every week. It's a Q&A with the guests. We sit down after the main show and patrons can submit questions before the show or during in the live chat. And then we ask Julian them after or whatever guests we've got going on at the time, we ask them after. And then you get that episode released on Patreon after the fact as well. So you can listen back to it. And you also get the bonus episodes with Jonas Lorenzen on there as well. So it's literally just Patreon forward slash Naughty Mythology Podcast. And it starts from £3 a month. It's the price of buying me a cup of coffee. And it really does help us keep the lights on and keep improving. Um, yeah, Julian, can you do you want to give a, a shout out to... I don't know if you want to plug your, yourself directly, but the, you know, the secrets of the yeah. ice stuff. So for anybody that wants to learn more, uh, I'd highly recommend you to follow us on Secrets of the Ice. You know, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we even have a YouTube channel where we upload all the videos we make for the other socials. Mm -hmm. And you can find us at secretsoftheice.com. Yeah. And uh, I also just want to thank my colleagues that, uh, you know, I'm from the Museum of Cultural History at the University of Oslo. And our partners that do a lot of the heavy lifting on this project is the archaeologists at the County Council of Inland County in Norway. Oh, nice. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, this, like I said, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. I, if, I, and I do suggest you, you follow the Instagram. You have some beautiful pictures on there. You, you take some... I, I presume it's not you taking the photos, but whoever is taking the photos takes some absolutely beautiful pictures. Well, there are a lot of people taking photos. Uh, I think if the ones that are out of focus, they're probably mine. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know whether you took a photographer with you. Um, oh, we Sometimes we bring a professional photographer mm -hmm. uh, specifically just to get nice shots. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, sometimes or most times we, we don't, you know, it's just us with our, but we take a lot of pictures, you know, as archaeologists, that's, mm -hmm. you, do, you know, you take hundreds of pictures every day. Yeah. And then, of course, we have good photographers here at the museum, you know, for studio pictures as well. So there's a lot yeah. of different people taking a lot of nice pictures. Yeah, no, it is it is beautiful. And I, guess I speak on behalf of everybody. We appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Um, if you do want to, if you want to follow me on anything, it's just Daniel and Scott Farrand one on Instagram or the podcast. It's just at Nordic Mythology, Nordic Mythology Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, hit the subscribe button, all those things. Oh, we did have to, um, here's a little thing. We had to get rid of our Facebook page the, the other day because Facebook decided that we weren't, they couldn't identify us as being, uh, but it, well, basically they said they couldn't identify us as being like real people. So we had to <laughs> get rid of our Facebook page and start a new one um, because, you know, Facebook's going to be Facebook, I guess. they. You see so much stuff slide by them and so many bots being made. And then I, I, genu I sent them my my driving license front and back image just as they yeah. asked and apparently they couldn't identify me <laughs> as being <laughs> being real and it all stemmed down to because we had uh login ins from two different ip addresses yeah. one from me in the uk and one from Alyssa in in oslo um and they saw the two different ip addresses and just went oh well these must be fake and then no matter what you do yeah. to try and prove that you're not there it's like nope fake so we, we, i just gave up in the end and started a new one so we do have a new facebook page which is just Nordic mythology podcast dash nmp because it had to be a little bit different to the first one um so if you can please just go and like that please leave a review because it helps facebook know that we're real people apparently if we have yeah. reviews so yeah if, if you can do that i would appreciate it uh, Julian, let's let's get to some questions from yep. from the patrons. Wonderful. 